We have with us today Gordon Pennycook, Assistant Professor of Behavioral Science at the University of Regina Hill. Professor Pennycook's research focuses on reasoning and decision making, including the differences between intuitive and deliberative processes. While he has published research on many topics, it is his work on fake news and disinformation that we will be discussing today. Professor Pennycook, I'd like to thank you for agreeing to speak with us and taking time out of your schedule today. Oh, my pleasure. So I don't know how familiar you are with the sort of fire hose of falsehood theory and terminology, but essentially the idea that fake news or disinformation, at least in part, is meant to just flood public discourse, muddle it. Um, so how might such a chaotic public space affect how people internalize information? It's, it's hard to say because that's, it's a very difficult to experiment to run, uh, like an actual study to run as a psychologist because it's kind of, now that's all the things that people are experiencing and you can't really control that. We, what we have done in experiments is given people sets of claims, uh, like and a number of them, like hundreds of claims in a row. And what we can vary is how plausible the claims are. And so what, what happens basically is if you give people a bunch of ridiculous and dumb claims, then they will rate the same uh, kind of ambiguous claim as being true more frequently than if you give them less junk. Okay, so what that basically means is the, the more surprising and wrong things that you give somebody, the more likely that they'll rate something that may or may not be true to be true, uh, because relatively speaking, it seems pretty, pretty unstupid, you know what I mean? Um, yes. But you can, you can adjust how stupid, things uh, how stupid things seem to people by giving people a lot of really dumb things and then giving something that they would otherwise think is dumb, but that relative to everything else they've seen isn't that dumb. So people do kind of adjust relative to what they see how plausible something is, um, which means just think about that next time you go on Twitter. You gotta, you have to curate what you're looking at if you, because it's going to adjust the way that you're assessing relative to what you're already looking at. So, can you speak to the factors that make fake news so effective? There's, there's been a lot of talk about the role of political partisanship in the sharing of fake news, um, where people are kind of deliberately you know, deciding to, um, to spread falsehoods. And our most of the research suggests that it's not really that big of a, it doesn't play that big of a role, not, at least not relative to just people automatically just kind of being lazy, just like seeing things on the internet, uh, falsehoods that they could easily debunk it with like a five second Google search of whether that's true, but they just share it anyways because they don't think about it that much. Um, and so the, the culprit is lazy thinking. And so that, this is what allows us to, fall prey to any sorts of disinformation campaigns, whether it's from politicians or teenagers in Macedonia creating fake news or whatever. So um, all these things align to kind of explain why we're prone to believing fake news. Do you see or identify any other enabling factors that make audiences especially prone? Um, in some of the readings I've done, we've talked about these sort of corridors of doubt where for example with the pizzagate scandal you know the belief in this deep state makes it possible mm -hmm. for some people to believe that there would be a secret pedophile room. yeah that's a great point when people make judgments about uh they if you give them like a example like a fake news headline that you would see on on facebook in the same format picture headline whatever um the way that people judge it is not based on the source of that headline which would be a good a good heuristic to use you know the source that tells you a lot of information about whether it's true or not they don't really do that what they do is they just judge it based on how plausible it sounds to them right but but if you um kind of live in a world where you are maybe exposing yourself or just believe for whatever reason a lot of silly things that aren't true conspiracy theories yeah. then you will be uh, the same headline is going to seem plausible to you and so what that means is even for those people, even if they stopped and thought about it, you know, that if they uh, if they just like pondered whether that's true, they're still probably going to fall for it because the 
the way that they assess the truth is based on whatever background knowledge they happen to have. And if all their background knowledge is filled with this junk uh, conspiracy theories and things like that, then they won't be very good at assessing it. So even for, for those people, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a double hit, which is that they're, they're probably not prone to think about it that much in the first place. And if they do think about it, they don't have the tools to assess whether it's accurate, uh, unless they happen to also have uh, digital literacy, which would be like learning how to fact check things on the internet. But given that they also have a bunch of believable conspiracy theories, they probably don't have those tools either. Uh, and so it's, um, there's, there's some proportion of the population that is going to be very difficult to, um, to help um, improve their capacity to detect fake news because they're, they're already too far, they're kind of deep into the, into the, the world of junk uh, that it's hard to debunk all of it at once, basically. Now that we're a couple of years removed from the election controversy and the, this sort of bubble where everybody seems to be talking about fake news, um, what value do you think the term fake news has today? Um, I'm not sure that the term has in, ever had any value at all. I mean, as apart from to um, to to kind of uh, organize this around a concern over disinformation more broadly. I mean, the, the specific kind of cases of people making up headlines and then them getting spread on Facebook, the, the kind of like that's the prototypical fake news, the Pope endorsing Donald Trump or whatever, a bunch of things that were, uh, that were just made up. That, that's a kind of, it's an egregious example of the thing that we've seen uh, for, for you know, millennia probably, which is, which is you know, aspects of propaganda, disinformation, falsehoods. Um, and so, so it, it, I think, I mean, if, if the term ever had any value was just to get people to recognize how easy it is uh, um, now and probably, you know, in the past always to spread falsehoods and how vigilant we have to be to, to have, um, a, you know, a real deep regard for what is true and know that it's not, we have to do work to figure out the truth. Um, fortunately, in like people always talk about the kind of scourge of social media in our present kind of media environment, but we're also at the kind of apex of being able to recognize the truth. That is, we have more information available to us than anyone ever has in the past. That the fastest in your pocket, you have a processor that has access to, you know, massive amount of information and actual legitimate knowledge um, that we can use at any time to debunk things. Um, the, the only thing that's stopping us is our own brains, that our, our, not, our lack of willingness to actually do the, in many cases, small amount of work to kind of recognize what's, what's a reasonable opinion, what is not. Um, and so the fake news thing is, uh, is just a good jumping off point for a much deeper and more important problem, which is we need to, we need to do work to recognize what's true and we have to understand how our minds work in order to do that effectively.